guys, welcome to this video. My name is Kirsten and I'm a trainee sports psychologist working to get qualified to become a fully fledged qualified sports psychologist. And in today's video, I'm going to tell you all about how to become a sports psychologist and I will also be covering what sports psychology is. So sports psychology is a very much a up and coming field. It's gaining in popularity, gaining in followers, gaining in people actually getting behind it and supporting the field of sports psychology, which is very exciting. But I also feel like it's still a very not well-known field. A lot of people, especially in my life, like my family, my friends, whenever I say that I am a trainee sports psychologist, they don't really know what it means or what I do or how I'm going to get there because I've done my degrees, but I'm still not a sports psychologist. I'm still not qualified. So they're very confused. And I feel like even as a trainee sports psychologist trying to get into the field of sports psychology, it's all very, very confusing. So I have learned a couple things along the way. I have gained some insight, gained some knowledge, and I'm going to try and share that with you. And hopefully this helps. This makes it a bit less confusing and this kind of gives you more of an idea of what sports psychology is, how you can become a sports psychologist and who you would work with, what you would do, all that kind of stuff. So let's get into it. What is sports psychology? At the very, very basics, sports psychology is the mental side of sport. It's all about the mental processes that go on in sport. It's all about the mental practices, the mental resilience, toughness, all that kind of stuff. But at the flip side, sport and exercise psychology can also be about how being physically active can impact you mentally. So it kind of goes both ways. You've got the how mental processes and mental skills can affect your, your sport, your performance, but it can also be other way around how sport and physical activity affect you mentally and affect your mental health and everything like that. So there's kind of two main sides, I guess, to sport and exercise psychology. The one I'm going to be focusing on mainly will be the whole mental skills in sport, mental processes in sport, um, that kind of side, rather than how physical activity impacts mental health, because the mental processes in sport is what I'm currently doing and it's what I'm most interested in at this moment in time. So that's what I'm going to be talking about most. As a sports psychologist, you'll work with athletes to develop their mental skills, to make sure that they can use their mental skills better in their sport to perform better. But it can also be working with athletes who are going through some kind of tough time. So sometimes if an athlete comes to you and they're injured and they're not really sure how to cope with their injury or how to stay motivated in the sport despite of their injury, it all, all those things come into play. So like I said, there's literally anything you can think of that is mental in sport. So anything that's not the actual physical training and lifting weights and building muscle and getting faster, stronger, jumping higher, anything that's mental, that's what sports psychology is all about. Aside from working with individual athletes, you can also work with a team. So at the moment, I'm a trainee sports psychologist with the University of Edinburgh and I work with two of their performance teams. So I do one-to-one -one work with the athletes, but I also work with the team as a whole. So I will give workshops or seminars for the team on a range of different topics that can either be topics that the athletes want covered themselves or it can be something that the coach will ask me to cover with the athletes and it's usually obviously less individual but if athletes want to they always have the chance to come and talk to me about it afterwards so it's not all individual one-to-one -one work it can also be with a team as a whole there's a lot of observation that goes along with it as well so you'll go and observe practice you'll go and observe games it's about building relationships. Sports psychology is not the same as clinical psychology, so where clinical psychology will actually work with mental health issues or can diagnose mental illnesses or disorders, that's not what sports psychology is, but sports psychologists can work with that. So if we have an athlete struggling with mental health, we can work with them on their mental health and we can work on their well-being and everything but we will not be diagnosing people we will not be prescribing any sort of treatment plan or anything specifically for their mental health it will mostly be related to sport but obviously how people are feeling and how mental health is impacting their sport is also a big part of that so it's not all about the performance it's not all about getting athletes to become better 
in their sport it's just about them as a person and how to help them in every aspect i should also say that this is very individual to the actual sports psychologist so some sports psychologist practitioners will focus more on the performance and they will focus more on the results other sports psychologists will be more focused on their athletes mental health and well-being so there is still a bit of a spectrum in terms of what the actual practitioner will focus on and work on but that's the general gist of it so i hope that gives you a bit of a better idea of what sports psychology is who is sports psychology for so sports psychology is for athletes as the main thing that everybody thinks about but it's also for coaches, parents of athletes, referees, it's for everybody involved in sport or physical activity who might be interested in sports psychology as a practitioner. So you might be interested in working in sports psychology if you have an interest in sport or a passion for sport. You might be interested in sports psychology if you want to work with a variety of different people, if you want to work in a job where not one day is going to be the same because there will also always be something else. You're working with different people, different personalities, different situations. So no one day is going to be the same when you work in sports in general, but definitely as a sports psychologist. You also don't have to have a passion for high performance sport or you don't have to want to work in the high pressured elite environment of sport. Sports psychologist is for everyone, all ages, all levels of sport. Anybody can benefit from a sports psychologist because, as I mentioned earlier, it's not all about the results, it's not all about getting them to that highest performance standard, it's also just about getting them to enjoy sports and getting them to see sport for what it should be, which is fun, inclusive, a way of being social, a way of moving their bodies. It's not just for the high and elite level athletes, it's for everyone. So now that we've covered what sports psychology is, who it's for, who might be interested in becoming a sports psychologist, I'll kind of move on to how to actually become a sports psychologist. So this is a little bit tricky. Well, not tricky, but it might be very confusing. It's a very roundabout way. It's a lot comes into it. A lot of things that I know I wasn't told about before starting this whole journey. So I'm hoping that with this video, you get a better understanding of what's needed, what you're gonna have to do, and how you're actually going to be able to become a qualified sports psychologist. So I must say, this whole section is going to be specific about becoming a sports psychologist in the UK. So I will leave links down below about how to become a sports psychologist in other countries, but because my experience is in the UK, that's what I will be talking about. So in the UK, there are two main ways you can become a sports psychologist, a qualified sports psychologist, and that is either through the BPS, so the, Brit the British Psychological Society, or through BASES. Um, so there are two organisations that provide you with a training route to become qualified. Both focus on slightly different things and there are slight differences to each pathway. So before you start, make sure that you check which pathway you want to go on, which one seems more interesting to you, um, because that will determine where you start even in your undergraduate degree. So the first step to becoming a sports psychologist is doing an undergraduate degree in psychology. This is the first step most people take. It's not a necessity. So for example, my undergraduate degree was not in psychology. I did my undergrad in sport and exercise science and I'm still here, I'm still on the pathway. It might just take you an extra year, which will be explained in a little bit. So first step would be do an undergraduate degree in psychology. Now the important thing is that if you want to actually become a qualified sports psychologist and get onto the trainee pathway, you need to make sure that this degree is accredited by the organization you wanna do the pathway with. So if you want to do the BPS route, you will have to have an undergraduate degree that's accredited by the BPS. Same thing for BASES. The list of universities and courses that are accredited by either organization will be on their website, which I'll also link down below. After you've done your undergraduate degree, you have to go on to do a postgraduate degree or a master's degree in sports psychology. Now, depending on the university, this might be called a bit differently. So it might be sport and exercise psychology. It might be sports psychology. It might be performance psychology. It's all the same thing in the end. But again, it has to be accredited by the organization that you want to become qualified through. So make sure it is accredited by the BPS or BASES. 
make sure that you're kind of following all of that, that that's all in place because if you do your degree but it wasn't accredited, it won't count for the organization, which is very annoying. But see, you go through a whole degree, at the end of it, you figure out it wasn't accredited by BPS or BASES, or it was accredited by the one that you don't want to do your traineeship with. There's not a lot you can do. I feel like there should be some ways to go around it. I haven't looked into that because that has not been my experience, but make sure that you check that before you start your degree. Then once you've done your postgraduate degree in sports psychology and you're still sure that you want to do this, you're still sure you want to start the journey, then it would be time for you to either go on to a traineeship and like actually get onto the pathway, or if your undergraduate degree wasn't in psychology, this is when you're gonna have to do a conversion course. So this was my experience. As I said earlier, my undergraduate degree was in sport and exercise science. It wasn't in psychology. So I had to do a conversion course after my master's in sports psychology. A conversion course is basically the essence of an entire undergraduate degree in psychology pushed into one year of a master's degree. So it's quite intense. It's quite a lot. It's quite a lot of information, coursework, all that kind of stuff. But again, depending on the university, it might put more focus on certain areas of psychology, it might be more practical, it might be more theoretical. That's all going to be depending on the university you end up choosing. And once again, same as with the undergrad and postgrad degrees, make sure your conversion course is accredited by the organization. So once you've completed what the BPS calls stage one, which is your whole academic route of undergraduate, postgraduate and potentially conversion course, that's when you go on to the actual practical pathway. So with the B BPS, that is called BPS QCEP. It stands for British Psychological Society Qualification in Sports and Exercise Psychology Stage 2. So QCEP encompasses the whole entire thing. So it encompasses both your degrees in university and the actual practical pathway traineeship thing that you're going to be doing. So right now I've completed stage one and I'm on to stage two. And then once you've completed stage two, you're fully accredited and you're a qualified sports psychologist. With BASES, this is called the BABIES CPAR route. And that stands for the BASES Sports and Exercise Psychology Accreditation route. So I'll, again, leave links in the description box to both of these websites where you can go in and like figure out for yourself differences, which one you like best, which one puts more emphasis on what you value most and that you can decide that way which one you want to aim to go to get on. So with the BPS QCEP stage 2, which is what I'm on at the moment, you can either do this full-time or part-time. I'm on the part-time route because it is nearly impossible to get paid work as a trainee sports psychologist. Pretty much all paid jobs are for qualified sports psychologists, which obviously I am not because I'm on the pathway to become qualified. So because of this, I have to do a full-time job alongside being a trainee sports psychologist. Otherwise, I would have no money and I wouldn't be able to live or afford my rent. So my pathway that I'm on, it will take me four years. So when you get onto the pathway, you have to submit a whole bunch of documents. You have to go through a whole list of documentations that you have to fill out, that you have to complete, that you have to get signed, all that kind of stuff. Um, and you have to have a training plan as part of that. So my training plan is set out for four years so that I can spread out that number of hours I need to get to become qualified and so that I can spread out the work to make it fit around my full-time work schedule as well. If this all sounds a bit daunting, don't worry. When you're on to the stage two pathway or the CPAR route, you will have a supervisor. So you will have to find a supervisor. You won't get one appointed which is kind of annoying because you have to put in a lot of work to find a supervisor, but at the same time, that also allows you to pick somebody who really aligns with your values, your interests. You can find somebody that you click with and you can find somebody that doesn't charge more than you can afford because supervisors will also charge you a fee. So now that we've covered what sports psychology is, who it's for, who could become a sports psychologist, and now that we've covered how to become a sports psychologist or how to what the steps are to be able to become a sports psychologist, I'm going to talk about a few of the surprises that I met along the way that I was not expecting that did not derail the, the trajectory of my qualification necessarily, but it did make things a little bit difficult sometimes. 
So the first one, I'll kick it off with a positive, is that sports psychologists don't just work with athletes. They don't just work in sports. It's a very much a high performance psychology background, which means that you can get into any high performance environment if that's what you want to do. So this means sports psychologists are working with the army, the navy, all that kind of stuff, all that high performance, high pressure environments, but also with musicians, with performance. You can even go into business in high performance, high pressure business environments. That's where sports psychologists can also find jobs. Secondly, one that's not as fun, not as positive, is the fees attached to becoming a qualified sports psychologist. So this is from my own personal experience. Again, I did an undergrad that wasn't psychology based, postgrad in sports psychology, conversion course. Now I'm on the BPS QCEP stage two pathway. There are a ton of fees and it is not cheap to do this. Obviously you have to pay for all your degrees, depending on where you are, where you're from, that's gonna be different price points. But keep that in mind, you have all your university fees, your degrees that you have to pay for. And then you have to pay a lot of fees to actually go through the whole pathway to becoming qualified. So you will have fees, again, from my experience, you will have fees for the BPS. So you will have your graduate fee, your membership fee, your division of sport and exercise psychology fee. You have the fees that you have to pay to your supervisor. You have a fee that you have to pay to enroll to become a trainee sports psychologist. You have to pay fees to the BPS to stay on the pathway. It is a lot, it comes up to be thousands of pounds. If you're interested, I can do a whole other video breaking down the finances around it, but it will be expensive. It won't be a cheap, quick thing. It will take years of hard work, it will be expensive, but in my opinion, it still will be worth it at the end of the day because it will be leading me towards a job I really wanna do and I am really passionate about. The third thing I want to mention is that it's not all just about talking with athletes, talking with coaches and just being around the sports environment. It's also very academic and research based, especially when you're on a pathway, when you're on a trainee sports psychologist route, you will also have to do some research, you will have to keep a log of things that you're working on. And just as you work with the athletes, coaches, as you give workshops, as you give seminars, you'll always want to make sure that they are science-backed. You want to make sure that they're evidence-based practices that you are applying in your work. So you will continuously be reading journal articles, you'll continuously be developing yourself as a practitioner, going to conferences, going to continual professional development opportunities, going on courses, all that kind of stuff. So it's not just having a chat with a sports person now and then. It is very much a intense, theoretical as well as practical thing to be doing, which for me works perfectly because I love the academics and the practical side of it. So it's all depending on what you wanna do and what you are interested in really. And then the final thing I want to say on the surprises part is trainee sports psychologist is a legally protected term. So you cannot call yourself a trainee sports psychologist unless you are actually confirmed on a pathway. If you're not, you can call yourself a performance consultant, a sports psychology consultant, although I'm not too sure about that one because I'm not sure if you're allowed to use the words sports psychology if you're not on a pathway. So maybe look into that, but you can call yourself a performance consultant, performance lifestyle consultant, because that's something we do as well, is the whole performance lifestyle stuff. Um, but yeah, so keep that in mind so that you're not getting yourself in trouble by calling yourself a trainee sports psychologist when you're not. So to close off this video, I just wanted to give some tips from my personal experience, things that I've learned so far, things that I've wished I had done since the beginning. Um, so hopefully me telling you these things will give you a leg up and give you some things to get started. So my first tip would be, it's a long journey. As I've mentioned before, it takes a lot of years, a lot of hard work, a lot of money unfortunately. So it's definitely a time commitment. It's definitely a financial commitment. So really think about whether it's worth it for you, whether this is what you want to do going forward. And don't just 
choose it because it sounds fun obviously that can be a good reason but really take the time to think it over and make sure that it is what you want to do and it is what you want to spend your time and effort uh, trying to become and trying to achieve second tip would be to network and talk to as many people as possible especially when you're at the start of your journey just reach out to people that's how i eventually got this role as training sports psychologist with the university of edinburgh is i just reached out to the person who is now head of sports psychology at the university i reached out to her before i was even on a pathway before i was even looking for any sort of jobs or any sort of hours to to work on um, I just reached out to her to have a chat because I was confused <laughs> about how to become a trainee sports psychologist or a sports psychologist so just reach out to people reach out to people who are on their way to becoming a sports psychologist people who are a sports psychologist reach out to your lecturers to friends also reach out to sports people reach out to athletes coaches even if they have no experience with sports psychology, try and figure out what they would want from sports psychologists. Try and figure out what they think sports psychology is about. And really just network, get your foot in the door, get to know as many people as possible and learn along the way. My third tip is to keep a some sort of a reflective journal. So this doesn't have to be a fully academic, like set out perfectly structured reflective journal. It can literally just be a diary where you write I did this today and it didn't work but just keep something that you can look back on that you can learn from so that you can see what you've done what worked what didn't work so that you can get better I feel like keeping a journal keeping a reflective journal is very important with anything that you do but especially with something like this it will for sure be so valuable to you when you're trying to think about what you've done how far you've come all that kind of stuff but it will also be uh, very important when you get to the submission points because on the pathway you do have to submit certain things you have to have reports and everything if you don't have a reflective journal it becomes really difficult because you have to remember everything you did you have to think about what you did when you did it what you learned from it whereas if you keep a journal as you go that will be just make everything so much easier my fourth and final tip of the day is to remember that you won't be able to help everybody and even the people that you will be able to help, it won't go right straight away. It might take some time, you'll have to build up connections, you'll have to build relationships, and even once you've done all that, you might not be in a position to help them, and that's okay. That's the nature of what we do, we're not superhuman, we're not magicians, we're not these people with some crazy power, we're just trying to help people with the knowledge and the experience that we've had, but it might not be for everyone. It might be that you're not a good fit for them, it might be that they might work better with somebody else, in which case refer them on to somebody else. It might just be that right now in this moment in time they're not receptive to it or it's not something that they are open to and that's okay. It's not personal, it's just not the time. For either you or them so that's the end of the video i hope this helped i hope this clarified some bits about sports psychology and about how to become a sports psychologist if there's any more questions that you have please just leave them down below i can always make more videos if you have any topics that you want me to cover just leave them down below as well i might make some videos on how to find a supervisor i can make videos on just vlogging what i do as a trainee sports psychologist anything at all anything you want let me know let me know what would be helpful let me know what kind of questions you have and i will also leave links down below for everything i've mentioned in this video as well as for how to become sports psychologists in other countries so i will leave some links for how to become a sports psychologist in the us in canada in australia and in europe so i think that's it for me if there's any more questions if there is anything else please don't hesitate to reach out i would love to hear from you i would love to discuss this with you and i will see you in the next one